Well, hey there, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Hero Hero Go Show. I am your host, Bo Ransdell. Um, this is a little bit of a, a different kind of show uh, today. Um, I wanted to do something that was reminiscent of sort of how the show began, where there's an informative piece. But I think the way this is going to work moving forward is that's going to be sort of its own show. Uh, this is something that I'm calling Go Show Classics. And these are movies that are a little bit off the beaten path, uh, even in terms of Asian horror movies. But they're sort of critical in the film history of Asian horror. And in this episode, we're going to go all the way back to 1926 for this one. And uh, this is a movie called A Page of Madness. And so we're not going to waste any time. Let's jump into it. Probably a little bit of a shorter episode, but it's going to be dense with information, I hope. So anyway, buckle up. Uh, and you may be asking yourself, Bo, what is A Page of Madness? And the short answer is that it's a silent movie from 1926 directed by a guy named Tenosuke Kinugasa. And we'll get to what makes the movie notable in a minute here. But it's kind of a minor miracle that we have this movie at all. And after its release in the mid-1920s, the movie just disappeared along with every known print. And that was the case for about 45 years until the director, Kinugasa himself, came across an old print of the movie in his personal storage. And I kind of love these stories. That There's really nothing more romantic to me than the notion of a lost book or a movie that's been rediscovered. And in this case, after nearly half a century. And so Kinugasa's movie stands as one of a very few silent movies that we have from the silent era of Japanese movies. And you might be asking yourself, my curious listener, why are silent films so hard to come by from Japan? And the answer is partially the ravages of time. There's a few earthquakes thrown into the mix. Um, but it's partially the efficacy of the American military. And during World War II, the United States and the Allied forces engaged in firebombing tactics against the nation of Japan. Of these, Operation Meeting House was the single most destructive bombing raid in the entirety of human history. It happened on the night of March 9, 1945, when 334 B-29s dropped about 1,665 tons of bombs on Tokyo. Uh, these were mostly what are called E-46 cluster bombs, which landed and then detonated two or three seconds after impact, sending globules of napalm everywhere. They were targeted at Tokyo's business district, too, and they, they initially dropped the bombs in a crude X pattern so that the airplanes behind them, the bombers behind them, knew where to drop their payload. And... These raids continued like through the night. I mean, it happened for days and days and weeks. But in this single night, the night of March 9th to the 10th of 1945, about 16 square miles of Tokyo was destroyed. And it resulted in the loss of about 100,000 lives in a single night. And most of these targets were non-military. And the raid itself was as much about retribution for Pearl Harbor as it was about military strategy. Although it was intentionally cruel, uh, and we'll get to why that was here in a minute, but in addition to the loss of life and the impact on Japanese industry and small business, another million people found themselves homeless as these giant fires ripped through the neighborhoods in Tokyo. And within Japan in recent years, there's been sort of an accounting of this event at a government level, but probably not in the way that you might think. Um, in 2007, the Japanese government officially apologized for these raids, and in the same year, a group of citizen survivors brought a lawsuit against the Japanese government, claiming that the government itself was responsible for these raids. And you might ask yourself, why not the United States? They were the ones dropping their bombs, and they honestly could feasibly be accused of war crimes for the use of these weapons against civilians. But by the time that Americans were dropping these bombs on Tokyo, it was clear that Japan was going to lose the war. And the suit that was brought against the Japanese government 
alleged that Japan was responsible because the government at the time saw the writing on the wall, saw that there was really no real way for Japan to win the war. But they continued to fight the war anyways, and that forced the Allied forces to use more extreme measures, including the atomic weapons used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to basically pummel Japan into finally declaring defeat. And the lawsuit was thrown out, but it kind of offers us some insight into how Japanese citizens, at least some of them, view those wartime bombings, less a a, a product of the American military and more that Japan just wouldn't admit that they had been beaten. But regardless of the politics and the morality of these bombing raids, they cost Japan not only tens of thousands of lives, but much of their recent history, especially film history, was lost at the same time. Uh, a lot of the Japanese cinema just burned up. You know, the victims of this war, along with the men and women who starred in those films. And so the discovery of A Page of Madness is remarkable for many reasons. Uh, when it was first shown, A Page of Madness had no inserts or title cards or anything like that to convey dialogue the way that a lot of Western films did. Uh, in Japan, silent movies were generally accompanied by a live band and a narrator, uh, who was known as a binshi, who would guide the audience through the events of the movie. And they would fill in not just information like, oh, here's what this character is saying, but would also sort of, you know, weave this tale, including the emotions of the characters and sometimes their motivations and that kind of thing. And uh, that tradition actually kind of continues. There are uh, what are known as neo binshi uh, that will accompany Japanese silent films when they're when they're shown. Uh, at least in Japan, I'm not sure that the neo binshi have made their way outside of Japan. But uh, I would love to see a Japanese silent film with a binshi present to uh, to get that experience. You know, something that, generally speaking, uh, you know, a century has passed since the last time. Um, that has been available. But uh, speaking of this movie, let's let's get into it now. And A Page of Madness is certainly a surrealist film. It's in the vein of like F.W. Murnau's The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, although between us, I think this is actually a better movie than The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Um, the director, uh, Kinu Gasa, was born in 1896, and he started working in uh, the film industry in 1917 at the uh, the tender age of 21. And he played uh, what's called an onagata, or uh, he, he basically was a guy who played mostly female roles. But uh, and that was you know certainly a job that you could have at the <laughs> that time in Japanese film. But he ended up moving on to directing, and the. Reports are that he first conceived of A Page of Madness after a trip to a mental health facility in Japan, uh, and then there was a subsequent encounter with the 123rd Emperor of Japan, Taisho Yoshihito. Uh, now, Emperor Taisho, at the age of three weeks, he, co he contracted uh, cerebral meningitis, and though he recovered mostly... He still had health problems, and especially mental health problems, uh, for his entire life. And, and that led his family to kind of hide uh, the young boy from the public eye. And, uh, but as he grew older, you know, he took on the mantle of emperor. But he was still largely kept away from, from public view because he still had lingering issues from this cerebral meningitis. But uh, Kinugasa apparently ran into him, and, and the idea of this sort of mad boy king, uh, as well as his previous tour of a mental health facility in Japan, led to Kinugasa uh, sort of conceiving of a movie based in and around a mental institution, as well as about the, you know, the concepts of madness and so forth. And so to bring this vision of his to this, the screen... Kinugasa sought the aid of uh, the, what are called the Shinkankaku, uh, and that, my pronunciation is probably terrible there, but uh, they were basically a group of these impressionist literary figures who also had this fascination with surrealist cinema, because some of that had filtered into, into Japan, right, for the stuff from 
uh, Germany and, uh, and, and from America as well. And they love cinema and, and, and what opportunities cinema could afford. Um, so the writing of the movie is generally credited to a guy named uh, Yasunari Kawabata. And Kawabata would go on to win the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1968 on the back of a career of short stories and novels and was generally considered, you know, one of the preeminent uh, authors who was able to capture sort of the spirit of Japan uh, in his writing. He was the first Japanese citizen to ever win the award for uh, the Nobel Prize for Literature. And while Kawabata certainly contributed to the story, no question about that, it's pretty clear, uh, based on some research, that he didn't really have anything to do with the production of the movie or rewrites or anything like that. So, uh, you know, as romantic a notion as it would be to say that this Nobel Prize winning uh, author was the guy who wrote this script, uh, probably not. He, I mean, he certainly had a hand in it. And, and but also you know Kinugasa and a lot of the other performers um, who were all part of you know this move, movement as well um, you know contributed significantly also and the production of the movie was almost entirely independent uh, the only uh, real attachment to a what would be considered a movie star at the time was uh, an actor named Masuo Inoue who agreed to be in the movie for free, uh, and that garnered some studio attention, which led to the movie studio Shochiku uh, stepping in to offer some facilities and financial support after Inoue uh, decided to star in it. And Shochiku was a major studio at the time, and, and they got the movie into shooting around May of 1926, and there were a couple of months of, of prep and shooting, and then the movie just appeared in, in theaters in July of that same year, in 1926. And on release, A Page of Madness screened in a couple of theaters that were generally reserved for foreign movies. And there was an idea in Japan uh, at the time, and, and one that you know uh, followed into the the decades after, that movies made in Japan, like domestically made movies, just weren't as good as movies that came from you know America and Germany and and a lot of the places that were really um, innovating with cinema. But A Page of Madness was kind of a different animal and was it was sort of head and shoulders above a lot of what Japanese directors were producing. And so the good movie theaters showed A Page of Madness, you know, over these what were assumedly superior Western films. And so they didn't want to relegate A Page of Madness to these domestic theaters that showed what, let's be honest, they kind of thought they were crappy movies. Uh, or at least just not, you know, fighting at the same weight class as uh, as the movies from uh, largely the West. And one of the contemporary critics at the time, though, after A Page of Madness was screened, was pretty quick to say that, like, hey, this is the first film-like film born in Japan. Uh, that is a quote that comes from a guy named Akira uh, Iwasaki, um, a critic at the time. But unfortunately, while critics absolutely loved A Page of Madness, uh, audience were really put off by it because it is a very surrealist film. Um, it is strangely Lynchian in a lot of ways, but that's, you know, assuming that Lynch did not borrow heavily from a lot of surrealist uh, uh, directors and editors that came before. But it has that kind of vibe, right? It is not... Uh, a very easy sort of good guys versus bad guys kind of movie. It's way more complicated than that. And that's also what makes it fascinating. And, and you know, it reminds us how lucky we are to, to even have this movie uh, in, in our catalog. But when it was rediscovered uh, in 1971, the film Kinugasa returned to circulation was also about 30 minutes shorter than the movie as it originally screened. And that trimming is generally believed to have been done by Kinugasa himself and that no version of this longer, 
like 140 minute film remains unless it it's sitting somewhere undisturbed in another storage facility somewhere uh, just waiting to be discovered and that's kind of a romantic notion as well but all right so enough about the heritage of the movie uh, let's talk about what makes a page of madness kind of a special movie regardless of the circumstances surrounding it and sure Kinugasa was a brilliant and avant-garde filmmaker in his own right and later in life, he would be rewarded with the Palme d'Or at Cannes, and uh, he would get an Oscar uh, the same year for 1953's Gates of Hell. Uh, but in these early silent days when A Page of Madness screened, he was mostly influenced by a Murnau movie, um, and, and specifically one called The Last Laugh from 1924 that uh, Kinugasa referenced quite a bit. And using that movie sort of as his impetus to be willing to do anything sort of with film composition and editing and camera placement and camera movement, all of that stuff would be employed to achieve this desired effect. And in the story, Kinu Kinugasa is telling this tale of a custodian, is how he's often referred to, at an insane asylum. Uh, the, this custodian was played by the, the guy Masuo Inoue that we talked about earlier. And he's taken this job to be near his wife, who is crazy, uh, which is not the scientific term, I understand that. But uh, she is uh, institutionalized because she tried to kill uh, their infant child. And the daughter of the custodian, the now adult daughter comes to the custodian and says, hey, I'm I'm going to be uh, wed, potentially. I have a suitor. And the custodian is a little freaked by this because on the one hand, he doesn't have a dowry uh, to, to offer, which, you know, if you're unfamiliar with dowries, it's just a traditional gifts that the, the father of the bride provides or the bride's family provides. Um, also... Uh, you know, the, there was this stigma attached to mental illness, right? That the idea was that in Japan at the time, um, that mental illness was hereditary. And, and we have learned uh, through the years that that's not entirely untrue. But, you know, in the world of A Page of Madness, that uh, carries with it a stigma that, you know, hey, maybe this guy is not going to want to marry the custodian's daughter because of uh, of the wife. So the custodian is sort of in this position where he is trying to potentially escape with the wife to hide her, uh, question mark. Uh, again, this is a little unclear. It's, it's a very surreal film, and, and sometimes the motivations are a little lost because we do not have a Benchy along for the ride to explain some of this stuff. But that seems to be the idea. Um, which results in a riot in the asylum. And, uh, and it, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the, the custodian starts to have these visions that may or may not be true. Uh, some we know aren't. Like, he has this very uh, vivid dream about winning this beautiful bureau that he can then use for a dowry for his daughter. But more than that, there's you know, a, a continuing sense that our custodian may be losing touch with reality. And, you know, the like the shame of his wife's insanity is weighing on him, and he starts to disassociate from reality also. And, the, you know, there's a giant riot scene inside this asylum where... Um, all the or a, a number of the male inmates are inspired to to violence because of the dancing of another uh, inmate, a, a young woman who continues to dance, and the whole thing is really disorienting in a good way. Where the our custodian character, at a certain point, you start to wonder, like, well, is he just going to end up behind bars? here as well because he is clearly getting crazier and more erratic in his behavior as well um, and to sort of sell this idea there are all these crazy like superimposed images on top of superimposed images 
where you'll see like lingering shots of bars as characters are walking um, away from the asylum and things like that. And it just creates this genuine sense of kind of frenzy and mania. And the editing too is really propulsive, especially at the beginning. There's this great sequence where you see rushing water and this uh, inmate at the asylum dancing and as the music increases or you know the the music of uh the the cut i watched that had been laid over the film but even without the music there is still this really uh powerful sense of of time speeding up and the shot speeding up and you're cutting between this water and this storm and this woman dancing and she's dancing and dancing and dancing and the storm's getting worse and it's it feels incredibly modern. It feels uh, somewhat Scorsese like at times. Um, and it, it like you would think that this was a movie that was made you know a half century later than it was based on the editing alone. And it also doesn't have. I mean, it, it does have some of the dramatic acting of a silent film, but even that feels more subdued. And it just feels like there's so much more going on under the hood of this thing. Uh, again, to compare it to Lynch a little bit, it just feels as if it's Kinugasa and and a lot of the, the writers and performers allowing themselves to express the concept of madness in any way that the, the form of cinema allows. And in the end of the movie, our custodian protagonist ends up fitting all of the inmates in this asylum with masks from the no tradition of theater. That's NOH uh, for those keeping score at home. And in the context of the time in which A Page of Madness was released, this would be considered a little bit of parody as those sort of theatrical masks were generally associated with the upper class and high society and, and that sort of thing. And so being worn by the mad men and mad women of this facility would be seen as kind of a you know, an ironic juxtaposition, if you will. But also there is no denying that these are creepy as hell masks also. And there's a sense that you're dehumanizing the inmates of the asylum that by painting this happy face uh, onto all of these characters that you're ignoring their essential humanity. And that's, that's sort of the journey of our custodian character through the film is to ultimately give up on the idea of saving someone who's who's insane and instead just papers over it with the happiest uh, possible wallpaper. And it, it's really striking. Like the, the last, I don't know, 10 minutes of this movie or so uh, contains some of the most striking visuals you're ever going to see in a silent film. Uh, it's really, really something. And so, A Page of Madness, if you want to check this out, it's available on Amazon streaming. Uh, it has a really nice HD print of it. Uh, I believe you can see it for free on YouTube as well. And I can't recommend it enough. Like It's a, it's a rare glimpse into the world of silent cinema from Japan, which is fascinating on its own. But it's also just a really good silent film, and it feels surprisingly modern for much of the runtime. And so if you do end up getting around to watching it, uh, then, then please drop me a line. Uh, you can, you can hit me up at Bo B O at Legion podcasts.com or jump over to the, uh, the Facebook group, uh, for Legion podcasts and, uh, and, and let me know how you made out with it. I'm, uh, I, I'm a big fan of this. It is something that I want to do a little bit more of on this show, which is to take a, an, an obscure movie that's kind of important in the history of Japanese cinema and kind of deep dive on it. Uh, so this will be the first of a series of, of these episodes uh, that'll be kind of sprinkled um, amongst the uh, the episodes with guests. And uh, we've got uh, a new series coming up soon, but in between now and then, you're probably going to get another one of these uh, on our next episode. And then we'll start diving into the world of, of kaiju movies with uh, one uh, court psyops. So um, that's what's ahead. I hope you enjoyed this one. Like I said, please let me know if you did. And, uh, and I'll see you next time here on Hero Hero Go Show. <laughs> <laughs>